And uh, we had this wonderful schedule planned of all the things that were going to happen. We were going to close in Spartanburg, pack those uh, budget trucks. We we're going to run down the road. We were going to be able to get the office closed down, a close on our house that's here because we're getting settled now uh, permanently here. And uh, we were going to have the church all kind of renovated and we we're going to do some more sprucing up. And uh, hey, by the way, I want you guys to know that those of you that put down the mulch, the mulch actually weathered pretty well. <laughs> I was there the other day and the, well, the mulch didn't do half bad. <laughs> so, <laughs> God watched out for the mulch. <laughs> oh, as if we didn't have bigger things to worry about than the mulch. But anyway, had all these wonderful plans and you've probably been watching it. Poof, God... I guess God drops a hurricane in our midst. And so uh, it's, it's been a whirlwind of a week. And I'm not soliciting your pity. Uh, you know, all of us have had a whirlwind week. Um, but m my thoughts have been scattered all across the state and with a hundred different items. And so as we were coming towards the weekend, I, I, I knew that we were going to need a word. And, I, and it's, it's in order to have a word, you know. You guys have faced this three times. This is this is number three. I, I uh, God bless you. I mean, that's all I can say. That 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 takes some steam. It can take some steam out of you. And I, and I'm not and I'm not rolled my sleeves up all that much. I mean, uh, but but I, I I respect as to what all that means. I can I can taste a little bit of what you've had to feast. Um. So you have my deepest respect. Um. But I, I just knew, because this is the first time we've ever faced it. So you, you got some experience under your belt. This is the first time we've ever faced it. And so I just kind of knew for the crew that's kind of been hanging out with me for a while that, you know, we just needed to probably hear a word. And, I, and, and honestly, I kind of wanted to hear a word. And I felt like the Lord kind of downloaded a couple things that hopefully will be an encouragement and uh, maybe bring some perspective and I'm just speaking those things, maybe that be not, as though they will eventually manifest 30 minutes from now. Um, as, as we read some things out of Isaiah chapter 59. And I just simply titled it this. Don't have any screens going on. It's just, it's just old school preaching this afternoon. And I entitled it God's Word in a Flood. How about that? God's Word in a Flood. Isaiah 59. And uh, I think I'm going to, I was going to read a lengthier portion of Scripture. Um, and we're going to get back to standing uh, for the reading of God's Word. I'm just going to read one verse in verse 19. But, but if we could, I'd like to get back to that. If you just stand with me briefly, just stand with me. I want to read God's Word. Let's reverence it as the people did when Ezra read the Word to them as well. Isaiah 59, 19. So shall they fear the name of the Lord from the west and his glory from the rising of the sun. When the enemy comes in like a flood, the spirit of the Lord will lift up a standard against him. God's word in a flood. And may, add, may, may he add his blessing to the reading of his word. God bless you. Sit. You may be seated. Thank you. Um, Isaiah lived uh, during Judah. As you recall, the nation of Israel had split. It had divided and a northern kingdom had already fallen to the Assyrians. The southern kingdom still existed and the southern kingdom's name was Judah. And the kingdom of Judah, unfortunately, had developed its own wickedness. And the people of God, the Jews of that particular time period, would probably be defined as nominal. They may have practiced a religion, their religion, but they were pretty nominal at uh, what they were practicing. Now, <clears throat> there's always a remnant. You realize that. And Christianity, if we rush to the 21st century, Christianity... Uh, may have its nominal features in some circles, but there's always a remnant of passionate believers. And so here in this southern kingdom, while the vast majority of the Jews were probably nominal in their religious expression, there was always this remnant that existed. 
And this remnant was passionate, it was zealous, and uh, they were doing their best to bear witness to the truth of God's word as they understood it under an old covenant. Now, the, the hard part about all of this is when you're a zealous, a passionate people, which are good words and good adjectives to be used to describe how you are in your love for the Lord. What's, what's difficult is, is that when you're living in an era of nominal religiousness, whether it's, whether it's Judaism or whether it's Christianity, when you're living in an era of nominalness, your passion looks all the more radical. When you're zealous, which is how you should be, and you, and you do realize you never mature out of your zeal. You know, some people think people are zealous when they're first born again, and it's when you're kind of youthful in the Lord, and as you age in the Lord, or as you mature in the Lord, somehow you're, you're, you get less zealous or less passionate. I don't know where that comes from, but it's not the Bible. It doesn't matter how old you are or how, old, or how long you've walked with God. The fact of the matter is that zeal and that passion should still be there. Now, I understand everybody goes through seasons, and I, I get it, so don't get on your own guilt trip or anything like that. But, but for all of us, I've walked with God now nearly 40 years, and, and I always remind myself, Kevin, you need to find your passion like you had it, you know, 48 hours after you met Jesus for the first time. But you got to realize that when you're living in a nominal age, your passion is going to look really bizarre, even to those who call themselves believers. Yeah. You're going to look excessive. You're going to look over the top. You're going to look off the chain. You're going you're gonna to look, you're just, you're, I've had people say it before, Kevin, it doesn't have to be that hard. You don't have to be that zealous. You don't have to do these things. And I'm saying, I'm not trying to do anything. I'm just being normal. This is normal. Normal walking with God. And so Isaiah is speaking to a nation that's predominantly nominal, but it has this remnant there. And he begins to speak to all of them and it was to prepare them for some challenging days. Now, I preached this before. You know, Judah would eventually fall to Assyrians as well. But here's the deal. They never, they never thought it would happen to them. They were 150 years away from when the northern kingdom fell. And so 150 years is approximately, what, uh, four generations. And once you get to four generations away from a happening, none of them in Judah thought it would ever happen to them. That's where we are in America. We're to the place where we don't think anything catastrophic or crisis in nature can happen to us, and we just walk on thumbing our nose at God. I mean, how many things need to happen to us as a nation before finally we drop to our knees, look up to God, and say, we give up? Apparently, we're not there yet. This is what's going on in the southern kingdom. And so the prophets come along, and of course prophets even look more bizarre. Because he's challenging the people of this nation, and basically he's saying this. This is, this is what really a prophet's job is. He says this, <laughs> I'm going to prophesy something to you in the name of the Lord. I've got good news, <laughs> and i got some bad news. All right? Now, here's the bad news. I'll give you the bad news first. The enemy's coming. That's the bad news. The enemy is coming. But now I want to give you some good news. God has a response. Bad news, good news. Now, it's exactly the same today. Today is exactly the same. It doesn't change. We are exactly at the same place as the southern kingdom Judah was in Isaiah's day. We are exactly the same place. But here's the good news. God is exactly the same God. Amen. Now, I believe, this is what I believe. I believe that God still speaks. And I believe in prophetic voices. And I believe in prophetic signs. Now, I, I, I don't go so far, and, and again, some of this takes discernment, I think, but it doesn't go so far as that I have to interpret every odd thing that happens in the earth as something like it's God. You know, sometimes just the earth is odd. And so I'm not interpreting everything as some big over-the-top thing with regards to God as saying something. However, having said that, I do believe God speaks through 
unusual events. And I believe that God does speak or can speak to us through natural disaster. He can speak to us if we have ears to hear. And he can speak to us through climate issues. You say, really, you believe that? Sure, I believe that. The Bible teaches us that. God always tried to speak uh, to nations when famine came across the land. Famine usually meant dry, no rain. And so that climate change God used in order to turn their hearts so that they would cry out to him. I also believe that uh, God spoke through flooding. Is that not true? I mean, we know in the scriptures God was trying to say some things through flooding. And I've always said that there are two sides of a sign. There's a sign, usually a sign uh, that God is giving as judgment. And then there's a sign that God is giving as promise. So every, every sign that comes into the earth, when God speaks, there's usually two sides to it. One of judgment and one of promise. I'll show you how this works. For example, when the uh, early church was baptized in the Holy Ghost in the upper room, one of the sign gifts was that of tongues, right? The sign gift of tongues came, the Bible tells us, as a sign of judgment to the Jews. But at the same time, it was a sign of blessing or promise to the believer. So here's this sign gift that enters in, and to one group, it's saying judgment, and to another group, it's saying promise. Now the key is, you got to be sure you're in the right group. Are you following me? Same with fire. If I got, you find the scripture, fire. Fire at times is a sign that's given with regards to judgment. There was, there was a, a, a dump, a garbage dump outside of Jerusalem where fire would perpetually burn and it was called Gehenna. Jesus literally used that terminology for that dump in order to describe what hell would be like. Gehenna. And so the sign of fire could be that of judgment, or how many of you know fire is what appeared on the early church's head, signifying what God was doing, that they had the fire of God. So judgment, promise. I could go down, earthquakes, God shakes things in order to destroy them, but at the same time, he says, as I shake all that can be shaken, that which cannot be shaken shall remain. Judgment, promise. And now we get to a flood. And most of the time, when people hear or see flood, they instantly leap to judgment, and with good reason. Because one of the most notable floods in all of Scripture was what? Noah. Yeah, see, that's that, you, Bible quizzing. There you go. Noah. Noah's flood. God sent a flood because he was judging. And it's true. Flood Flooding has a judgment component to it. But hear me when I say this. He also said that there would come a day when the latter rain would join with the former rain and a deluge would take place of his spirit. He literally began to say that there would be a flood, a flood of his spirit would come. And I read to you at intercession time, Ezekiel 47 which the prophet prophesies of this rising water signifying the Holy Spirit that would finally flood out everything, but it wasn't flooding it to destroy it, it was flooding it to heal it. Are you with me? Judgment, promise. Now, here's, here's this is what I think. I don't, I'm not a scientist, so I, I'm going to say this carefully because I'm not a scientist. I'm not. I'm just this, I'm just a preacher. What's a preacher? No, not much, probably. I don't believe really in global warming. I believe in global groaning. Not global warming, global groaning. Now I'm going to get to this passage here. How many of you know Pastor Baird will make, yeah, I may go out here. But I'll get back to Isaiah 59. Hang on. In Romans 8.18, the Bible tells us, Paul tells us that creation groans. They, they groan for something. It's groaning for something. The very creation's groaning for redemption. But the redemption, interestingly, as it's groaning... It's more specified than that because, and we were talking about that over at the building, weren't we, Pastor Jan, that the whole creation groans 
for the manifestation of the sons and the daughters of God. That's what creation is groaning for. And so hear me when I say this, when we see hurricanes and when we see earthquakes and when we see fires raging and when we see these things, hear me, there is a judgment component, there is a promise component, but really the creation is groaning. We're watching with our very eyes the groaning of creation. See, going out, where did Tampa Bay go to? It got sucked out to sea. It's groaning. Creation is groaning in these things. Why? It's because there is something that wants to, the creation wants to see, it wants to sense, it wants to be touched by this manifestation of the sons. And I'll just, I'll just make it gender free and daughters of God. And hear me, I honestly believe the Isaiah 59 passage is the prophetic declaration that God begins to say here when he says, that yes, the enemy is going to come in, but there will be a standard to respond to it. And what that standard is, I believe, is that manifestation of the sons and the daughters of God. Now the question, here's the question. I, I, just, I ask questions of the Bible. This is how I do Bible study. I just start asking questions to myself. Sometimes it's okay to talk to yourself. You're not always crazy. Sometimes you're actually, when you argue with yourself, now you might be crazy. I don't know, maybe. But the question I asked is, then, then this manifestation, how will it come? Okay, it's going to come through the groanings, the creation groaning. But, but let me make it a little bit more practical language. All this, the standard or this manifestation comes about through crisis. I'm going to let that linger for a minute. The groaning of creation is crisis. What we went through in Charleston, what Houston went through, what Southern Florida went through, what the West is going through with their fires, what Mexico has gone through with its earthquakes. The groaning of creation is really what you could just simply define as crisis. You know, people say that they want Revival. People say they want an outpouring. I'm not sure. I'm not sure we understand the context that exists in order for that to come. It's usually crisis. If I could take you historically, I don't have time today to take you historically through revivals so that you could see the context of those revivals. They came in crisis moments. I will tell you this, that when God does his last blast move on the earth, it's going to be in the midst of chaos and anarchy and crisis. And as Americans, we don't do crisis well, do we? No, no, no. We don't do chaos well. We don't do anarchy well. Do you understand? Prophets come. I, I was just at a conference recently, and the, and, and the name of the conference was Disruption. And God is sending disruptors. You know, that's what a prophet is. He disrupts things in order that they can find their right order. But hear me, America, and I'm not saying you, I'm not picking on you. I'm sort of prophesying and prophesying through Facebook Live and YouTube and other places as well. I guess kind of putting it out there in the air because I, I know there's some great, wonderful people in this room. I mean, you have been through crisis. You have proven that you can weather some crisis. So I'm not picking on you. I'm just saying it out loud as a whole. We don't do disruption all that well. We don't do it well. Oh, we'll disrupt ourselves. Well, what pastor said three weeks. Uh, I could, uh, okay, I can probably do that. But boy, you go four or five weeks, and I don't know that I can do that. <laughs> well, 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 praise God that you live in Charleston and not Houston. <laughs> or in Mexico. Or in the darkest point in the continent of Africa. What would you do? See, we don't do this well. But this is the key. This is the key to some of our understanding is that, that God moves when there's crisis. And the reason he moves when there's crisis is because that's when there's half a chance of getting into people's hearts. Now, it's interesting here, in, and I just want to mention this. Let's get to Isaiah, lest you think I forgot. Isaiah 59, 19. 
Because I'm not a he, now I know Greek, just so you know, I do know my Greek. I'm still fluent in it. I kept up with it so I can, I can still read the Greek originally. I cannot read Hebrew. So I have to do study just like everyone else in the Hebrew. But it's interesting. In the Hebrew, in verse 19, and some of you may have heard this already, but I just want to, it bears repeating. Literally, the translators, for whatever reason, always put a comma after the word flood. When the enemy comes in like a flood, comma, the spirit of the Lord will lift up a standard against him. And so it gives you the opinion as you're reading it that there's a moment that, that crisis comes or adversity comes, hostility comes, and it comes upon you in, in, in flood-like proportion from the enemy. And that's, that's how you would read that and you'd be reading it right because of that one little comma. And how many of you in here could testify, maybe all of us could, that there have been times in our life where we've gone through a season where, yes, I can testify, it feels like adversity has come like a flood over me. Like a flood. But in the original language, interestingly, that comma isn't there. It's not there. You can check me out. Go Google it, because you know everything you find on Google is true. But this is true. So listen to me. Listen to me read this a little bit different. It says, So shall they fear the name of the Lord from the west and his glory from the rising of the sun. When the enemy comes in, stop. When the enemy comes in, like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord will lift up a standard against him. Now all of a sudden, you have one that's judgment and one that's promise. And the flood isn't the enemy kind of sweeping in and doing all of his thing. It's the Spirit of the Lord suddenly sweeping in, as Ezekiel prophesied. And as he rushes in, in fact, the word, I was again just reading about the Hebrew. It says, when the enemy comes in, the literal Hebrew, you could say, rushes, rushing in flood. Rushing in flood, the Spirit of the Lord will lift up a standard Against him. So God is going to do something at some point in the future when the enemy begins to do what he does, when crisis comes, when anarchy and chaos comes, like a flood, like, like an instant. Brad was telling me the other day, he was standing out there at the site on Beast Ferry with Doug, and, and, and at that point the water had yet really to get into the building, but you guys were standing there and you were watching, and you said literally with our eyes we could see the water rising into the building. He said it was wild, it was crazy. I don't even remember all the adjectives you used. That's, that's what we're talking about. We're talking in this short period of time, this massive thing is going to happen. It's going to rush in. The Spirit of God is going to rush in and He will raise up this standard, this manifestation of the sons and the daughters of God. Now, let me get through this quickly here. Let me, just, let me make sure we're all on the same page. What is a standard? What does it mean that God will raise up a standard? What is a standard? Well, I've already told you that I think the standard is analogous to that manifestation of the sons of God. Now, this is all kind of religious speak at this point. You say, what practical, what does it have to do with me? Just bear with me. The standard in Old Testament times, the standard, if you can imagine, if Israel was going to battle and all of the tribes had come out with their men of war to go to battle, all these tribes were lined up. These tribes would have at the front a banner holder, long pole, banner of some form, signifying certain things. It was an insignia. And uh, it was most of the time used in battle, but it was, it was used at other times as well. But they would, this is what they meant by they said, raise the standard. They would raise up this pole with this flag. I guess we would call it a flag on it. And they would raise the standard. And sometimes when the standard, you know, if, if, if somebody was losing the battle and the standard fell, it would discourage the troops. But if they could see 
They could see people in the heat of adversity or a tribe that was fighting in the heat of adversity and that everybody's fighting and this thing's going on and people are wondering what's going down there in the battle. And then all of a sudden, this insignia is raised up in the air. It would bring this sense of encouragement. This flag would be flying, signifying that that, that tribe or that group of people, you know, they were, they were prevailing. That was the sign of the standard. Now, if we can understand what the standard meant, it might help us to understand what God will raise up with regards to the manifested sons and daughters of God. Now, I want to give you just a couple quick things here that, that God is speaking, at least to me, with regards to the standard. When he raises up a standard, he's talking about you and me, talking about us, talking about his people. But it's compared to this standard, and number one is this, that the standard represented identity. In other words, every tribe had their own standard. This is who we are. This is our identity. This is what I believe, this is what I believe the Lord was just saying to me. The, I, I believe, and this is, you, you can, I'm just, I'm speaking prophetically now, so you'll have to weigh this. But I believe a flood came to us. Now I'm talking about us personally right now. A flood came, hear me completely, everyone. Because God is stripping away our identities in order that we might have his identity. His identity. Who are we? Who are we? Do you know why Moses had to go to the desert before he actually could go to Pharaoh? It's because he had to have his identity stripped. I believe that. Because remember, he, he had grown up in Pharaoh's courts. And I don't know what all Moses thought about himself or whatever, but he went into the desert in order to be stripped of whatever his identity was in order that when he went into the courts of Pharaoh, he knew his identity. And that was, he was a, a piece to be used, a standard to be used in order to communicate God to Pharaoh's court. I could go down the list. You know why David went to a cave? To strip his identity. He was no longer the sheep herder in the fields of Jesse. But he had to have that identity stripped because God had a calling for him. He had an assignment, a mission for him. And when he came out of the caves of Adullam, there was a new standard that he held. In fact, his standard was such that the messianic kingdom would forever be analogous to David's kingdom. Can you imagine that? They would say, you know David's kingdom? That's a lot like what the Messiah's kingdom is going to be like. Can you imagine that pressure? You know why the Israelites went into the wilderness? It was to strip their identity. To strip them of their identity. Who are we? What is our identity? Why a third flood? You have to ask yourself. I'm just ask questions. Now, I, I, maybe I shouldn't ask this out loud, but this is what I've come to the conclusion. Pastor's denim. God, no, here, I'm going I'm to, because I, I'm going to give you the answer. The answer is, even for legacy, because our first Sunday was to be there. That was our first Sunday. We, how could you time it like that? Our first, not our second Sunday even. Not the Sunday before, but the first Sunday. You can't, you can't time things like that unless there's something going on here. I mean, are, are, really, are we so dense not to think something's going on? And are we so dense to think after three times something isn't going on? Really? Are we that dense? So I'm speaking not just to you, I'm speaking to us all in this remark. We're either cursed... Or God's saying something that's so incredibly, abundantly beyond what we could ask or think. That in this mystery, he's going to bring forth an identity and a standard. I, I don't know, that's just in me. I just even felt an anointing. It just came like that. It's stripping it away. I mean, what more can we do? There's not much left. That's just, we're down to the two by fours. I was there. I saw it. You can't strip it away any more than that. Good Lord, we tried to paint a wall and it's just stripped away. That's how I feel. I feel like I'm down to my two by fours. 
Do you yet? Because the reason God gets you to that point is because He's going to build a new identity. That's in His plans. Identity. Our identity is in Him. Making His name great. Who are you? I'm just, I'm just one who's making His name great. That's it. Period. Now, t- Number two is this with a standard. The first one's identity. Number two is this. That the insignia or the standard represented his values. In other words, when you raised your flag, it was saying this is who we are, our identity, and these are our values. And I I could list values. Obviously, we value righteousness. We value holiness. We value the things of the Spirit. I, I could give you a list of all the things we all commonly hold value in value. How many of you know some of the things that, that are really, we would, I would hope we would think are sort of base level foundational values. Not everybody holds those. You mean you guys do all that funny stuff in the spirit? You betcha. It's my identity. It's my value. The Holy Ghost is alive and well on the earth today. And here's the banner. I'm one of them. Shabbatah. <laughs> Number three, the insignia represented to whom we give allegiance. Our insignia, the standard, it says God will raise up a standard that will declare our identity, it will declare our values, and it will declare to whom we give our allegiance. Our allegiance is reserved for one and him alone. And then the last one, which I really like, number four, and that's the last one of this list. I got another list here, just a second. But the standard was raised as a rallying point when when others were under attack or crisis. In other words, when a big battle's going on and a standard would be raised, people could see the standard or the insignia and they would say, there's the insignia, we know who they are, we know what they value, we know to whom they give allegiance to, and we're under attack, we can rally there. I'm telling you, America is going to face a crisis And we're already, God's trying to get our attention. Two planes into Twin Towers didn't get our attention. Bombs in Europe don't get our attention. Think about all that. There was a Boston Marathon, a bomb went up. It didn't get our attention. What's going to get our attention? Hurricanes don't seem to get our attention. Fire doesn't get our attention. Earthquakes don't get our attention. I'll guarantee you, God will get our attention. And when that happens, and it's not God doing it, hear me, all God has to do, according to Psalm 91, is lift his hand of covering from off us. He's not doing it. He just says, I don't have to preserve it anymore. And then he just lets sin and the enemy take its course. And when it becomes big enough, the attack is great enough, the adversity is it's hard enough. There's going to come a moment people will be reeling and they'll, they'll say, what, where, how, what, how, yeah, whoa, whoa, there's a standard. We see the standard. And like a flood, it comes into the earth. And people will run to it. Isaiah 60 says, even kings and princes will stream to it. This standard. Now, I wrote down here, what is the crisis? What is the crisis? I, you know, it's easy to identify the world because the world, you will always find places in crisis. It has always been, it is now, it shall forever be in crisis. You have friends right now who are in the world and they're in crisis. Mm-hmm. Crisis will forever be in the world. But God flooded our church. Or allowed it. I guess I'll I'll put it in that terminology. He allowed it to take place. Why? Now, now, in fact, why, why, Lord, you didn't flood just one church. You flooded two churches. Maybe you don't like that terminology. I'm sorry. But the fact is, he oversaw it. Why? Now, hear, hear me. 
This is the part that takes revelation. This is the part that the light bulb has to come on. This is the part that you have to get a hold of. And, and, and don't take this in any way personally, but we are becoming the sign. Now, you may not have thought it was going to look this way. I didn't. Actually, I really thought that God would cause the sign to look a whole lot more prosperous and powerful and, and opulent and majestic. And I always thought that's probably how God should do it. You know, it would be, it would be convenient. That's not how God does it. Listen, we are becoming the sign. We, we are being positioned to be the sign. Nobody would even suspect it. Because right now, there are those who think we are fools. Bad news, good news. God has chosen the foolish things to shame the wise. God is speaking. And I realize we're the ones experiencing the brunt of that speaking. But hear me now. We're living in an age where I'm talking about the church now. I'm talking about church at large, that we're living in a lawless church age. And God needs a standard of righteousness in his church. They aren't going to run. They aren't going to run to the best church coffee bar in town. Are you following me? I'm just kind of this is what this is what prophetic sounds like. They're not running. They're not running. Oh, the fog machine. They got the best fog machine. Let's go over here. Did you see the lights? They've got, the, they've got that strobe light every time the pastor walks across stage. Isn't that cool? That's the coolest thing I've ever seen. Let's all run. To, we're in crisis. Go to the strobe machine. We're in crisis. Go to the laser show. We're in crisis. Go to the playground. They've got an injection plastic playground that would make McDonald's jealous. <laughs> That's not what the world's going to run to when it's in crisis. It's not going to run to lawlessness. It's going to run to righteousness. We're living in an arrogant church age where, where men market themselves and blow their own trumpets and wave their own flags. And God is looking for a standard of humility. And even here in Isaiah 59, it says, so shall they fear the name of the Lord. The, the people are going to find, the world is going to find a people who hold a standard of the fear of the Lord. I fear the Lord. The fear of the Lord. We're living in a pragmatic age where the first question that is asked is always, will it work? Rather than, is it God? And they're not going to run. I'll guarantee you, when the enemy comes in and anarchy and chaos comes in, they're not going to be running to the place where it works. They're going to run to the place that hears God. And finally, we're living in an age where the church at large is carnally clever. We can come up with more clever ideas and market them and start conferences. And, and the conference ought to be called Clever. Clever 2017. It ought to be, it ought to be entitled Clueless 2017. Because they're not going to run to Clever. They're going to run to the power of God. So the question now boils down to it again. These are just some thoughts in the night that I've just put down here. But the question now comes to us in all of this that we're walking through. And here I'm just here to say it. I'm going to walk through it. I have determined in my heart that I am walking through it because I am not going to miss what God has at the end of all of this. I'm just not going to miss it. Some will miss it. God bless you for all of you. But I'm not going to miss this one. No, 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 not me. I got it now. I got it. What do we do? I want, there are three words, and I want everybody to repeat these words. I'm going to say them first, and then I want you to repeat them after me. Three words, and they're this. Remember, Remember. Refuse, refuse, and receive. receive. One more time. Remember, 
Okay, let's just do it together. <laughs> Rem remember, refuse, receive. One more time. Remember, refuse, receive. Now, what do I mean by that? Number one, remember. What do I mean by remember? Remember this. As we're walking all of this out, more is going on than what you see. Remember. Remember. Because you're going to have people come up to you and go, hadn't that place flooded three times? And you want to go, oh, really? really? Oh, I didn't know that. I didn't know that. No, 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 no. Hear me. More is going on than these eyes can see. You go, it's crazy. You're right. It's crazy. What God's about ready to do is going to be crazy. Remember. Number two, refuse. Refuse to be discouraged. Refuse to quit. Refuse to... Refuse to receive all the, 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 the carnal junk. Refuse it. Get a hold of it and say, I, I determine I'm going to be encouraged and I'm going to keep going. God is up to something here. I refuse to be discouraged. I refuse to quit. I refuse. There's not many things that I probably have control over. But one thing now I have control over is this. I don't have to quit. I don't have to quit. I don't have to give up. I don't have to. I just make up my mind. I don't want to. Remember, refuse, and then the third thing is this, receive. What do I mean by that? I want you all, everyone under my voice here, and some will be watching live, others will watch it later on YouTube, but hear me, can we today receive, and, and, and there's no sense of arrogance or haughtiness in what I'm about ready to say, believe me, the reason we're walking through this is, is that we're down to the two by fours, remember, you can't be real arrogant when all you got is a two by four. But what you can still do is you can receive the mantle or you can receive the calling or the invitation. I don't even know exactly how to call it, but you can receive from God right now his tap to be that standard. That you and I can actually be God willing, that manifestation of the sons and the daughters of God. And the first thing that comes to mind, even for me, it's like, Lord, do you, do you get what you're working with here? And he goes, I know exactly who I'm working with. And believe me, I knew who I was working with when I tapped Moses. And I tapped David. And I tapped a Joshua. I mean, these guys, these guys didn't glow in the dark. You know, sometimes we look at biblical characters and we think when, you know, at nighttime they just glowed in the dark. I mean, who could, who could be them? Moses killed a guy, murdered a man. Moses got so aggravated, he threw a stick at a rock and God had to judge him on it. How many times have you felt like throwing something? I mean, I tell you, I just confess up. There are times I felt like throwing something. I felt like throwing people. Think about this. Just there, these, these guys, think about Peter. He, Peter, on the day of the crucifixion, is swearing like a sailor. Paul is killing Christians. I mean, I could go down the list. These people were not glowing in the dark. But there was something in them that yielded and received what God wanted to do. And when it hit them, they became this manifestation or standard by which the world looks at and says that, that hears from God, that knows God, that walks with God. You get to that and something will happen that can only be explained by God. Now, here's the key. Will you remember? Will you refuse? And then will you just receive? Doesn't mean you're going to be a millionaire. Doesn't mean that your face is going to be on some magazine. Doesn't mean that anything's going to happen to you by the way the world defines success. 
What this means is, is that God will do something in, in, in you and through you and upon you that will be of such magnitude it will manifest, it will manifest the fullness of his possibilities in other people's lives. And if that's something you want, then I'm telling you, I believe it's something God's doing. That's God's word in a flood. God's word in a flood. Release the